This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Ask the Expert with Steph. Hello again, everyone. We're back for another episode of Ask the Expert. And today we are lucky enough to be joined by the fabulous author historian Stephen Virapin. Stephen is here today to discuss the relationship between Queen Elizabeth I and her successor, James I. Hi, Stephen. Thanks so much for coming. Hello. Thank you for having me. Well, this is an interesting topic today because it's very specific. Elizabeth was famously unmarried, no children. Uh, So the question of her successor was always quite a mystery for a really long time. So hopefully, let's see if you can help us to understand their relationship and their interactions, I guess, leading up to her death. So maybe we can get a clearer picture of why he was chosen. So firstly, can you explain to the listeners how James was related to Elizabeth in the first place? Like, why do we even bother with him? Yes, absolutely. James was actually the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who was Elizabeth's cousin. Now, all of this came about because of the marriage between the Thistle and the Rose, it was called. This was the marriage between Henry VIII's sister, Mary, and King James IV of Scotland, the great Renaissance King of Scotland, who died at Flodden. What this caused, really, and it was foreseen at the time, is that if the Tudor line died out, there was always a chance that one of the Stuarts would end up with a good claim to the throne. And it was recognised by Henry VII, as I said. And, of course, at that time, he probably didn't foresee that his line would die out, or at least he certainly didn't want it to. But what he kind of correctly guessed and what he said was that, Oh, it doesn't matter if this happens at some point in the future, because if Scotland and England have to unite under the Stuarts, it will really be the addition of Scotland to England rather than England becoming the property of Scotland. So he had that foresight, and I suppose history would show he was quite right about that. This brief interruption is brought to you by, well, me. Do you love Tudor's Dynasty? Consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Patrons get access to all kinds of amazing things that the everyday listener does not. Find out more by going to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty, and click Become a Patron for details. All right, back to the show. You mentioned that James was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. Yes. So obviously the relationship between her and Elizabeth is noteworthy as well, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Yeah, I think so let's... That, sorry, that's a really good point. Everyone always talks about this our big rivalry, this yes. big rivalry between the two queens, which is interesting and it's given rise to lots of books and things. But um, maybe I'm biased, but I'm sort of starting to think the relationship with James was almost more interesting. <laughs> It's more colorful. The fact that there even was a relationship is is very interesting. Um, so I think it's I think it's definitely I'm glad that we're here talking about it today because yeah the the relationship with Mary Queen of Scots and Elizabeth has been discussed a lot in movies and books and obviously other podcasts. So this is perfect. So we'll start off with James and his mother though. Now were they close as he was growing up? They were not close at all. Um, I mean, this is understandable. Obviously, Mary, I'm not saying Mary wasn't a loving mother. The problem was she never really had a chance to be. She was run out of Scotland when he was still a baby. And so there was never really any chance for them to bond. There was certainly never any chance for him to know or remember her. So um, there was no chance for closeness. Mary did try to establish a relationship with her son whilst she was in captivity, I suppose we'd maybe now call it a long distance relationship. Um, James had a very interesting attitude and it developed over time uh, towards his mother. He did show himself willing to have this relationship from a distance with her when he was convinced to do so by a man called Esme Stewart, who was a, another cousin on um, James's father's side. They had a, a kind of curious relationship um it's often portrayed that Esme was James's first love I think it's I think it's more complicated than that now you know the uh, relationship the famous relationship between Elizabeth and Thomas Seymour I do know that relationship yes 
But what's not given a lot of attention is that a very similar thing happened with James when this um, cousin Esme came over from France, who was about 37, I think, at the time when James was 12. And by all accounts, it seems he um, recognised that James was, uh, we think now probably bisexual, and began encouraging his beliefs. And we think, we don't know how far they're sexual relationship when it's obviously up for debate but i think now we would call that abusive as well but what esme did because it was nominally catholic he convinced james that re-establishing some sort of relationship with his mother would be a good idea this was quite a shame for mary because mary mary began to get her hopes up you know so uh, here's a man a frenchman who's now met my son up in scotland He's acting on my behalf. He's going to help me establish this relationship. And it was sad, I think, even more so because she'd sent a note and a gift of a pony and saddle. And I've got the letter here. She wrote, Dear son, I send three bearers to see you and bring me word how ye do and to remember you that ye have in me a loving mother that wishes you to learn in time to love, know and fear God. Elizabeth, however, would not let the present out of England at all. So attempts on Mary's part to sort of create this relationship failed, really. And the Scottish Privy Council that had guardianship of James said, no, all communication from his mother must go through us. So even when, I think it was in 1579, Mary again sent a gift. This time it was little miniature golden guns. And they were returned without James even getting hold of them. But one thing I do have to say about James and his relationship with his mother, although he didn't know her, he had this sort of respect for her position as a former queen, and he just didn't know the woman. And one of the really interesting things, I think, about King James is when he knew someone personally, he could be utterly devoted to them. When he didn't know them, he showed an almost reptilian coldness towards them. So he'd be really, really merciful and friendly to friends and to former lovers, but he would be completely ruthless if he didn't know the person. So the example I think of there is Walter Raleigh um, or Raleigh. James had no personal relationship with him and so quite happily saw him go to the block, whereas people that James actually had formed a relationship with, he was utterly charmed by them, he was merciful to them, he drew criticism actually for being so merciful. So I think um, it was a complicated relationship, it wasn't close at all, he did respect her as a former crowned and anointed queen, but he had absolutely no personal feelings for her. So that said, what position did he take when it came to her execution? I know you mentioned that he was merciful sometimes if he had a close personal relationship with somebody, but kind of just turn it turn the other way if he didn't but in this case this person that he didn't necessarily know was his own mother so what was his position when it came to her execution because we've gotten some questions from listeners wondering if he ever spoke out against her execution or if he tried to prevent it or if he was siding with it what did what did you what did your research show about that um well, first of all, it, I mean, it must have been a horrible, horrible position to be in for anyone, really, to be to be facing that kind of prospect, whether he knew her or not. He did make various attempts to save her life. So we all know the Babington plot, you know, when Mary was uh, discovered in 1586 to be colluding, supposedly, with this um, Anthony Babington, this a plot for escape from captivity, and, of course, to... It, uh, assassinate Elizabeth and take her place. When this all came to light and it looked very likely that Mary was going to go to trial for it, James's first reaction was not to believe that Elizabeth would really put his mother to trial. That was crazy. One queen didn't put another queen on trial. It was unheard of. When it looked likely that there was to be a trial, he sent south a man called Archibald Douglas. Archibald Douglas almost certainly murdered James's father, first of all. He was uh, James's father, Darnley. Douglas was, I suppose I could be charitable and say a rogue. He was a, a, an unpleasant man, an untrustworthy man. Now, one of the things that isn't often talked about is that James, at first, didn't expect execution to be the outcome at all. 
he doubted and he thought he could um, stall a trial even coming to pass. So amongst Douglas's secret instructions was something very curious. Douglas went south with a note from James proposing marriage to his cousin Elizabeth. It's often said that Elizabeth's last suitor was um, the Duke of Anjou or Duke of Allenton in Anjou. In fact, it was James. James proposed to his cousin. Now, this wasn't a serious proposal, I don't think. It wasn't anything like a serious proposal. My belief is that he, he made this secret proposal to muddy the waters, to try and tangle things up and stop Mary coming to trial, because it just confused matters. When the trial went ahead, though, he stepped up his plans to um, speak up on Mary's behalf, really. His problem was that no one wanted to go. In Scotland, no one wanted to get involved in this because they feared what would happen if they tried and failed to save Mary's life. Eventually, a man called William Keith of Delney was chosen. He went down south and his instructions from James were to reserve yourself up, which means just dilly-dally, no longer, in the earnest dealing for my mother, for you have done it too long, and think not that any dealing will do good if her life be lost, for then adieu to my dealing with that estate, England. So James was in, a, again, a very difficult position, and this was because he genuinely didn't want anything bad to happen to his mother. Or, no, I should rephrase that. He didn't want her executed, but he also didn't want her found not guilty and released back to Scotland because he'd established himself by this point as King of Scots. He wasn't too keen on having a mother coming back and claiming the crown. So his delegation down south met with Elizabeth. And I think we have to think now about well, what was Elizabeth's attitude? James didn't want his mother executed. Elizabeth wanted Mary dead, but she didn't want to be responsible for the death. Unfortunately, her government, her parliament, really did want Mary executed. So we end up in this strange situation where the two monarchs of the countries don't really want Mary dead, but they also don't want her alive. <laughs> So uh, it was extremely... Poor strange. Mary. <laughs> yes, I know. I mean, she really was being um, treated as a, a, a pawn at this at this point by her own son, which I think was the really bitter thing. In fact, there's a really sad thing. Um, James also sent south a man called um, the Master of Grey, Patrick Master of Grey, who we think was another one of his, his lovers. Um, and Mary, he was another deceitful character. I th there were a lot of them about in Scotland at the time, I have to say. Everyone who was a politician was um, deceitful is a nice way of putting it. But um, when I don't think much has it, changed. <laughs> it seems I know, to be right? that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, when um, Mary found out earlier that Grey had been double-crossing her, she refused to believe it and she said, no, it's uh, that man Grey has forced my child to do this and has forced my child to do that. So Mary, I think, was in a bit of denial that James really didn't have much of an interest in her, which is, which is sad, I think. It's really quite sad. But obviously we know what happened was that um, James made somewhat cat-handed attempts to save his mother's life. So in, in addition to sending down these... um these little delegations of what I think were relatively minor politicians. He took the step of writing South himself with a letter that wasn't directed to Elizabeth, but was meant for her. And he made the mistake of mentioning Elizabeth's parents. And we all know what happened to Elizabeth's parents. So James wrote, A strange example indeed, and so very rare, as for my part, I never read nor heard of the like practice in such a case. He was referring, of course, to um, the trial and potential execution of a queen. I am sorry that Elizabeth has suffered this to proceed to my dishonour, and so contrary to her good fame as by subjects' mouths to condemn a sovereign prince descended of all hands of the best blood in Europe. King Henry VIII's reputation was never prejudged in anything but in the beheading of his bedfellow, Anne Boleyn, Elizabeth's mother. But yet that tragedy was far inferior to this if it should proceed as seems to be intended. 
Elizabeth, well, what do you think Elizabeth's reaction to that was? Is that a rhetorical question or are you really? Are you gonna... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm really asking, what do you think Elizabeth thought on being told by this younger king that her father's reputation had never been judged until he killed her mother? Right. So I would say that, see, in my head, people judged what he was doing far before mm. he had her killed. Oh, yeah, I think Because of right, what yeah. he had done to Catherine of Aragon. Um, but I don't know if that's what you were getting at. Is that what you were getting at? <laughs> no, all I was really getting at is Elizabeth was furious. Elizabeth had a curious relationship with her father. And I don't mean in his lifetime. I mean, afterwards, she made a great show all the time of being extremely proud of being this lion's cub. Um, so she absolutely she absolutely detested, and I think she was quite offended by, you know, how dare he write to me, cheekily reminding me of what happened to my parents. The other danger, I think, actually, in the letter that James wrote is he drew attention, obviously, to Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. What happened... When Anne Boleyn was executed, or immediately before she was executed, was that Thomas Cranmer annulled the marriage. So Elizabeth was actually illegitimate. She was legally a bastard, even though Parliament acknowledged her as queen. So James was unwisely, I think, and I don't think it was deliberate, I think it was just unwise. He was reminding Elizabeth that she was the illegitimate child of this Boleyn marriage that ended in bloodshed. So... As you can probably imagine, it did not endear her to him, and it certainly did not make her um, delay proceedings against his mother. In fact, when she was sure. asked by his delegation if she could delay it for a week, she said not for a minute, something like, not for an hour. Oh, way to go, James. <laughs> the ultimate insult, right? Absolutely. So the mission and the various missions, actually, that James sent south, I think he was earnest in them I, and, and again it was it's such a shame because it's a really difficult and impossible he was in an impossible position i think ultimately elizabeth was going to execute mary i don't think there was really any doubt of that but we have to think about the different audiences i think in each country so the english parliament were were being for mary's blood so elizabeth was going to have to do something but in scotland it's curious despite this cabal of protestant uh, nobles having cast Mary out years before, they st even they didn't really want England killing their former queen. It was seen as a gross insult if she was going to do this. James, again, came up with a potential solution. It wasn't a perfect solution, but it was a potential solution. And he thought, and he wrote it south, actually, well, can't she just be put in some stricter confinement? Can't you just take away more from her? Walk her up even oh, tighter. Yeah. But again, that fell on deaf ears. And as we know, the execution went ahead in um, in February. In fact, yeah, it's the anniversary today, February the 8th. Yes, I was. I, I, I noticed that this morning. I don't know. It's going to be a couple of weeks before this episode airs. But I did notice that it's interesting that we happened to schedule this. I thought it was the... deliberate. Oh, no, well, that's and just a spooky, no, spooky coincidence then. No, it's not, it, it, it is a, a coincidence and just means it was meant to be. Yes, absolutely. So before I continue with the, the questions from the listeners, I just wanted to clarify one thing. I know that we had mentioned, you had mentioned that he was younger than her, but also might possibly have either jokingly or seriously proposed <laughs> to her. What was the age difference between James and Elizabeth? Oh, maths, really? You're asking me math, a maths question? No, the, uh, the oh, difference geez, was about 40 years. So I'm a historian, Elizabeth not a mathematician. Was... <laughs> Elizabeth was born in um, 1533. James was born in 1566, so I make that 33? Oh, it's a significant, yeah, yeah, it was a significant. Well, at the time of the marriage yeah. proposal, she was 52. She was just about to turn 53 in the September. And he was, he would have been 20. Yeah. And so no, probably no chance of heirs, even if it did go through. No, I think that's what really shows it up to just be a, a bit of nonsense. But um, it would benefit neither country because 
it wouldn't give Scotland, it would mean Scotland wasn't going to get an heir and Elizabeth would get no benefit from it either. I mean, she'd seen off, she'd seen off more persistent and gen, genuine suitors in the past. I do think it's interesting. It's, it's never mentioned. In fact, um, a few months ago, now I'd come across this reference to this marriage proposal somewhere years and years and years ago. And I think it was last year on Twitter, I tweeted and I said, Twitter historians, help me. James, at some point, I am sure, proposed marriage to Elizabeth. And no one has a clue what I was talking about. No one, and people are saying, no, it's, I've never come across that. I don't think so. I've been crazy. And I started to doubt myself. <laughs> I started to think, maybe I dreamed it. Maybe I dreamed that at some point James had proposed to Elizabeth. And it was only fairly recently I came across the reference in the state papers. It was August and. Uh, 1586. Oh, I want people, uh, is anyone listening? I want you to write to us or tweet us or whatever and send us what you've heard about this because that's a huge, that's a huge bit of information, even if it didn't, you know, obviously really end up happening. That's huge. And it's really interesting. That's crazy. So now moving on to the relationship now, he's the King of Scotland. His mother is has been executed. And now we're going to focus on the relationship between the two of them. How did their relationship occur as far as their communication? Did they meet in person ever? Or was it always in writing? Or how did they how did they communicate to one another? Yeah, so the no, they never met in person. So it was a bit like the relationship between um, Elizabeth and Mary Queen of Scots herself. Um, Elizabeth never met Mary and she never met Mary's son. They began a personal correspondence in the mid-1580s. They had written to one another through ambassadors and things before that, but it was only in the mid-1580s that they began to write personally to one another. And there's a huge body of correspondence between them. And it's wonderful. It's delightful. I mean, it's sometimes really catty. It's, it's sneaky. You can really see, and it's interesting actually because he was younger, of course, as, as we just discussed, but you can see these two political animals circling each other in the letters and trying to trip each other up. And we know from various other sources that the kind of duplicitous things they were doing behind the scenes. So it's nice to see these letters where they are faking <laughs> this amity and this friendship. And you can see her trying to build a relationship, or at least I, I wouldn't even say build, I'd say trying to perform a relationship where she's the wise, experienced monarch and he's the pupil. And you can see him on various occasions having none of that, you know, when she pushes too far. So it's, it's they had a, a very interesting um, correspondence, but it was, yeah, it was all long distance. Yeah. What do you think they had in common that, regardless of the fact that they might have been pretending in certain ways um, or, you know, feigning a relationship. What do you think they actually did have in common that that caused her to bond with him and end up ultimately choosing him as her heir? Oh, well, a couple of, first I'd say I, I'm not convinced she chose him. Um, I mean, that's a, a, another question I know, but um, I don't think Elizabeth ever really chose anyone to be her successor. It's a strange thing because it, we know from hindsight, yeah, of course, James succeeded and the, the Stuarts went to England in 1603 and everything, but um, Elizabeth had a kind of willful blindness, if I can call it that, when it came to the succession. She would occasionally show favour to one candidate, occasionally to another, and then back to... And I always get the sense... She had no interest, I don't think, in what happened after she died. She had no interest. I think she was, I mean, she was a religious woman, we know that. So I get the impression that she thought, oh, God will sort all of that out. You know, when I die, what will happen will happen. God will be in charge of that. But um, what caused them to bond in so much as they ever did bond? I think they shared difficult childhoods uh, and certainly childhoods if you think about it with with distant parents and, and murdered parents and all of this sort of stuff so i think they shared childhoods which forced them really forced them to be wary cautious political creatures um 
we know, I mean, we know a lot about the youths and the, the young lives of both. And I mean, I wouldn't have survived that, you know, the way that, the way both of them are brought up, constant fear and this inability to trust anyone. But one thing actually that on that subject, similar childhoods and similar youths, yes, but it resulted in and manifested in two very different ways. So I would say Elizabeth throughout her life trusted no one. I mean, she had friends, she had um, favourites and all of this, but she never really, I, I think she always knew they were they were in it for something. She, she always, you know, she was a cautious, cautious woman. James, on the other hand, um, he fell in love very easily. So he trusted and put his faith in and defended and protected these people. So rather than being suspicious, he reserved his suspicious caution for um, people he didn't like. Or didn't or people know, he yeah. didn't know very well. Or didn't, yeah. Um, people that got close to him, he he really did you know, wear his heart on his sleeve. So I think it's interesting how similar childhood resulted in, in different personalities. Yeah. Now, as far as religion, um, did they both see, we got a couple of questions actually from our listeners about the Presbyterian movement that was heading towards kind of both of their ways, actually. What did what did each of them know about these changes? It's not the 16th century unless there's talk about religion, of course. It's, uh, absolutely. absolutely. Everyone's... And I'm not even going to ask you about witches. <laughs> Because that's another one that always comes up. <laughs> that would have been good fun too. Um, right. Now, religion in the period is it, difficult because we tend to think, I mean, we all know about Catholicism versus Protestantism. I think less often we focus on, well, Protestantism wasn't just Protestantism. That's like Catholicism wasn't even really just Catholicism. You're different, like you're Jesuits and you'd all this sort of stuff. But, um, the problem, I think, in both countries, in both Scotland and England, was that reformers, and by that I mean, I think what they often called them at the time was the hotter sort of Protestant, in neither country did they think that the Reformation had gone far enough. So if we start with Scotland, when the Reformation happened, this is back when Mary Queen of Scots was uh, still in France, the infrastructure of the Scottish church, or the Kirk as it was called, hadn't been settled by the Reformation. So there was a lot of unfinished business there. The Presbyterians, these were um, those who subscribed to that Calvinist sort of system, they wanted to rid the Kirk of what it thought were Popish bishops. So they wanted to completely re-establish the Scottish Kirk under this Presbyterian system, no bishops, Kirk elders in charge and all of that sort of stuff. James, however, was against this. So even though he was a Protestant, he still viewed with jaundiced eyes these extreme Protestants and extreme Protestant Presbyterian ministers. His maxim was no bishops, no king. So what he thought was, well, if you get rid of hierarchy in the Kirk, what's going to stop you getting rid of hierarchy in secular life. He did, throughout his reign in Scotland, make attempts to make his mark, because this uh, it was still a period, that, as I say, the, the Reformation itself had not established things long term, it hadn't established the infrastructure. So first of all, he passed the 1584 Black Acts, as they were known to the reformers, by which he made himself head of the Scottish Church, just as English monarchs were heads of the English Church. This, however, obviously irritated the reformists, the Presbyterian ministers, and he eventually had to pass the Golden Acts, which handed power to the Presbyterian system and the General Assembly of the Kirk. So it left episcopacy or ruled by bishops trampled for a while. He was clever enough to retain the supremacy, so that's it spiritual supremacy, um, which put him in a powerful position later when he once again tried to re-establish bishops. So, so it, it can be quite unusual to talk about this because, I mean, we live in a secular world now, I think. I, I'm not a, not a religious person. Um, 
but this really mattered to people you know the, the systems of government and churches and things really really mattered to people so that's what was going on in scotland there was this ongoing fight between these hot reformers these presbyterians who want to completely basically set themselves up as not even a rival to the crown but above the crown so it was a theocracy they wanted i think ultimately so that was going on in Scotland, and James came to really hate and distrust these Presbyterians, mainly because they showed him no respect. I mean, they they thought, yeah, he he calls himself a king, but I thought one of them, David Black, said, kings, all kings and queens are devil's bairns, devil's children. So he, he was sort of, you know, horrified by this lack of respect. But Elizabeth had her own issues with Puritans in England. So these were, again, reforming Protestants. She never trusted them. I think in a sense she probably had it a bit easier though because headship of the Church of England was more established than um, headship of the Church in Scotland, which James only kind of loosely managed to get hold of. What she also benefited from, I think, is that Puritans in her country, yes, they were loud and vocal and all of this, but they knew she was an old woman. And certainly in the 1590s, they knew she was an old woman. They knew that she wouldn't last forever. And I think what a lot of them essentially thought is, oh, when she dies, it's fine. We'll get change afterwards. As long as we get a Protestant succession, we'll be able to get change afterwards. So this actually set up a lot of problems, I think, in store for James's reign. Of course, he didn't help himself because throughout the whole time he was battling with the Kirk and trying to establish episcopacy ruled by bishops he was at the same time entertaining a lot of catholics because he was worried throughout his time in scotland you know what happens if elizabeth dies and all these english catholics know that i'm a protestant and, and reject me so he was trying to keep catholic hopes alive at the same time as um presenting as a valid and you know worthwhile protestant successor so it's no surprise, I think, to find that their correspondence, James and Elizabeth's, is quite often mired in this this ongoing religious turmoil that's that's really simmering in Britain at the time. That's actually a really great segue into one of our next questions. You had mentioned that he was, although he was Protestant, he was quote, I guess for a lack of a better term, you know, walking on eggshells around the Catholics in England. So what do you think the the treatment or how do you think the treatment of Catholics in England differed once James became king? Um not very much, I think is the, is the that was the problem. James had I think sold himself as all things to all men. And the problem there is, well, there's going to come a, a crunch time, you know, when you have to prove that you're either tolerant or that you're going to, to grant leeway in things. And what he actually did when he came south, when he came to England, is there was a brief suspension of fines for Catholics. Uh, so, you know, the recusancy fines that Catholics would have to pay if they, if they didn't attend Anglican services. There was a brief pause on those. The problem was that he needed money and this was the problem throughout james's life he needed money all the time um constantly because he spent it like water um and he ended up re-establishing the fines so catholics you know were thinking you know we've been promised much and now nothing's changing and james was even shy about this he held a conference in 1604 at hampton court the hampton court conference unimaginatively titled and his it was a very verbose time he gave lots of speeches his main goal was to batter down the puritans because he didn't like puritans but at the same time to give nothing to the catholics so he sought this kind of middle ground and i think the problem with that is it, it satisfied no one so i mean this was a time of religious extremism and i think if, if you satisfy no one it just becomes a, a waiting game to see which side snaps first. As it turned out, it was the Catholic side, which of course resulted in um, November 1605. And 
gunpowder treason and plot. So, uh, yeah, it was a. I can sympathise with his position. His idea, throughout, I mean, his main political goal was to unite Scotland and England politically. And I think one of his means of doing that was to stress continuity, to say, look, nothing's changing. These countries are basically the same thing. Nothing's changing. And it just caused lots of problems because people wanted change. Lots of people on lots of different extremes wanted change and he wanted to change nothing. So as we focus kind of now on the transition from Elizabeth to James, who were the other people that you find were other potential heirs? Because like we said, she had spent all this time making sure that she stayed out of it and didn't name anyone. And we don't even know if she wanted to choose James. And we know of people that she felt threatened by. Of course, we know the stories of Arabella Stewart. We know the stories of her and the Gray sisters. Who do you think were actual potential heirs kind of in the running uh, with with James? Uh, yeah, the, the great Elizabethan succession crisis, it wasn't that there was a lack of um, heirs. It wasn't that Elizabeth left no successors. It was that she left too many successors. There were too, many. too many, exactly. There were so many people, yeah. right? Uh, there was this. Week. So who who do you think the list? What do you think the list looked like? Well, there was there were many lists actually written up. I mean, there was a whole underground cottage industry of succession tracts and succession tract literature all over Europe. I mean, this wasn't confined to to Scotland or England, Britain at all. Uh, people were writing lists and according to their own biases, putting this claimant over that claimant all the time. Um. So, first of all, I think we have to think, well, let's let's stick with the Tudors first of all. So we have the claimants through Henry VIII's older sister, Margaret. We have the claimants through his younger sister, Mary. We have claimants going back even further. So we have Yorkist claimants. We have um, Lancastrian claimants, which, of course, was... Um, the Spanish Infanta, funnily enough, because she was descended from John of Gaunt. So you had a lot of people putting her forward, even though she... Oh my goodness. See, I have my notes here and I have the tree right in front of me. And it's already busy enough without even taking that part into consideration. So thank you for bringing that up. Go ahead, go ahead. It's it's crazy. I mean, it's uh, just all these people. And um, I mean, dynastically, they would all have a claim if they chose to press it. not a lot of them did really choose to press it, but uh, people were happy to do so on their behalves. What I find really interesting here, though, is a question that I don't think is often really talked about. And it's not uh, who who did Elizabeth favour, who did Elizabeth choose. It's, well, why did it matter? Why did it matter what Elizabeth wanted? I mean, when she's dead, she's dead. So the really interesting question to me is, why was James, and to an extent as well, Mary Queen of Scots before him, why were they so desperate to get Elizabeth's approval for what should have been a dynastic right? Do you know what I mean? I mean, it should. It was meant to be the, the system of primogeniture. Yeah. You shouldn't have to. It'd be like, I suppose, a bit like, oh, did Edward VI need Henry VIII's approval to be, the, to be his heir? No, of course he didn't. He, would, he just was because he was the next in line. And it was because this line was disputed in all kinds of ways that they sought approval. But more than that, I think Henry VIII set a, a precedent with his succession. He had various succession acts, so the 1543 succession act, for example. Um, and what he did with these was listed essentially who he wanted to succeed to the, the English throne and in what order. And that wasn't sort of extreme or, or strange enough that a, that a king should just, you know, write a list as if primogeniture didn't matter, I'll decide. He also had Parliament approve that list. So what we ended up with was a system by which the monarch and Parliament dictated what beforehand would have been a, a line of succession, which blood and primogeniture and all that sort of stuff had decided. Elizabeth, as I said, was legally illegitimate, but she was parliamentary uh, authorised. Parliament had accepted her as Queen, had authorised her as Queen. So we start to see a growth, I think, in Parliament kind of gaining authority by virtue of accepting who the heir is. In 
that hand in hand with the monarch of the time. So I think James, like his mother before him, really needed and wanted Elizabeth and her parliament to legitimise them, especially because, I mean, there were all kinds of arguments thrown up against them, that they were foreign born and that um, the English crown was just like a piece of English property and no alien could inherit it, uh, which of course ended up being a lot of rubbish because James succeeded quite smoothly. So we start to, I think, get into just what was a really messy situation and it was caused by Elizabeth not just naming an heir and having Parliament approve it. And we can sympathise and we can say, oh, well, Elizabeth herself said, I, I could never love my winding sheet. You know, if, if I name an heir or choose an heir, everyone will look at the heir and no one will look at me anymore and I'll be I'll be the, the fading sun. But I, I have limited sympathy with that position because, once again, if we think of people like, well, Henry VIII didn't view having an heir as a, a huge threat and a huge danger. He viewed it as something absolutely crucial. James himself, he didn't view his son as, as this huge, terrible threat. It was something good to have a clear and distinct heir. It was part of your job as monarch. So I think it was Elizabeth's insecurity that really put her in this position where she's actually scared of having an, a, a visible heir. Because it wasn't normal to be scared of that. It was normal to want that. Interestingly, we know, um, you know, that Henry VIII's issues with paranoia kind of crept into his daily life. And it and it's the parallels with, with Elizabeth are really interesting because even though it's not necessarily about, you know, her health, the, the paranoia seems to be so prominent in her in her day to day life. Yeah. And I think um, I think part of that is because she was in an insecure position and she was in an insecure position because of Henry VIII. I mean, Henry VIII, as I said, did annul the Boleyn marriage. So Elizabeth was in this anomalous position where she was illegitimate legally. And it's often said as well, so you, and you see it in books all the time, that Elizabeth was illegitimate in Catholic eyes, but she was actually illegitimate in all eyes, in the English legal system's eyes, because it was a Protestant Bishop, uh, Bishop Cranmer, that dissolved the Boleyn marriage. Now, Mary, uh, this is Elizabeth's sister, Mary, Mary Tudor, her parents' marriage had also been dissolved, but when she became queen, she had Parliament overturn the annulment and re legitimise the Catherine of Aragon Henry VIII marriage, which made her again legitimate. So she had Parliament acknowledge that she was legitimately born and legitimately approved as queen. Elizabeth never did that. She wanted to do it, but uh, Cecil, William Cecil, um, later Lord Burley, he talked her out of that. He talked her out of legitimising her birth and her parents' marriage. And the idea was that, well, Parliament has accepted you as queen, let sleeping dogs lie, you know, it's a, that's enough. Don't sure. open up the past. Um, but I think it really did make her terrified of uh, and rightly so because there were people backing Mary Queen of Scots and there were people backing all these various attempts against her so um, I think it all goes back to Henry VIII's actions <laughs> so much in the period does it goes back to what he was up to what he had done that had repercussions for his children and their lives. I'm going to put you on the spot now Stephen what who do you think was the appropriate choice to succeed Elizabeth? Uh, it was James, I think. It, it was James. And I don't say that for any reasons of um, dynastic blood or you know any of this sort of stuff. Because um, I think the reason why it had to be James is if it were anyone else, I think there might have been some sort of war with James. I think James would have, because he'd been spending years building up support or trying to build up support, he wouldn't firstly have let anyone else take the throne, I don't think. At least not without a fight, as much as he could muster a fight. He would have put up a fight. But secondly, he was experienced as as a political leader. 
I mean, by the he really sort of came into his own, I think, in the fifteen nineties and started to make his mark in Scotland. So he was experienced, and more than that, he had children already. So by the time he took the throne, he had an heir, and he had several heirs, he had several children. So, I mean, if we look at the other candidates, you can kind of imagine the trouble that might have been caused had any of them taken the throne when James you know, he'd been gearing himself up for it for years. Um, it, it would have been messier than it was. And a, a, the real reason behind it as well is he was clever enough to create... A, I mean, he had a wobble with the Earl of Essex. He he um, intrigued with the Earl of Essex, but luckily Essex burnt all, all James's letters, all his correspondence. Um, but James was then canny enough to hook up remotely with... Cecil, this is not William Cecil, Lord Burley, but his son who had taken over as Elizabeth's principal secretary and chief, chief minister. Pre, not prime minister, because that's a bit early for that, but chief minister. And Cecil was, he was in favour of James becoming king. So I think with that in mind, if anyone else had been declared king in 1603, Mar late March 1603, they would have been going against Cecil, they would have been going against James, they would have been going against Scotland. It would have been a mess. It would have been a big mess. So um, James, I think, was legally not the only choice, but politically, I think, the only choice. So James it is. Well, James it yes. Is. Stephen, I really enjoyed our chat today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, Thank you very much for having me. Oh, anytime. We hope you come back. Is there anything that you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, what's going on in, in your world? Do you want our listeners to know of any books or speaking engagements or anything that we can we can support you on? Um, well, thank you. Um, I do have a, since we're talking so much about Henry VIII, um, I've got a book, a novel coming out in May. It's the uh, date is May the 5th for it. And it's set in 1522 when the Emperor Charles V visited England. So you might get a glimpse of Henry VIII, you might get a small glimpse of Anne Boleyn in her first year at the English court. It's a, a murder mystery and the detective style character, the, the main character, is the fictional, I should say, son of John Blank, you know, the um, now more well-known Black Trumpeter, or Black Trumpet as he was called at the early Tudor court. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh, it's that's going so back exciting. a bit in time from James. Yes, that's great. Do you have a title yet? Or is that Yes, it's called Of Blood Descended. Of Blood nice. Descended. Bloody title. I'll, I'll send you the cover on Twitter Please so you can do. see it. Nice. Yeah, we want um, to see it. And then is the is the cover. timing of that book the same in the UK and here in the US? Or do we have to I wait? I don't know yet. Um Polygon who are publishing it. I think are still working with US publishers. So I I don't know about the US. I know it's available available for um pre order in the UK because I pre ordered it myself as well. Um, but yes, yeah, I think it's still a few months yet. So this we're in February now, so we've got a few months to see what deals are done with US publishers, if any. Well, congratulations Fingers on close. your book. Yes, and we all look forward to to reading it. So thanks again for coming. And before we go, as usual, uh, I have to just give a shout out to all our listeners who wrote in today with the questions for you, because we would not have an Ask the Expert without our listeners. So thank you very much to Katie Ray, King Charles the First Return, Noala Wolf, Gail Joe, Julie Rowan, Dr. Maria McPherson, Kim Platten, NA625, Douglas Breeden, Book Love 26, Beth Hunt, Nick Sweet, Patrick Giovanelli, Travis Bai, Carrie Ferguson, Bridget Crossan, and Stacey Stark. And of course, thank you very much to our guest, Stephen Virapin, and I'm Steph Storer. Thank you so much for listening to Ask the Expert. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty. 